to back and return trip and that everything works. And then you can concentrate on tweaking the algorithms and tweaking the parameters of the algorithms and maybe having multiple algorithms compete and vote to see who gets the best result. All that stuff, uh, it's going to be necessary to actually fine tune what you do with machine learning. But if you try to do it from the beginning, it, it is really frustrating. Uh, when you write code, write really small code samples around a specific algorithm with a known payload in a, in, in a way that, uh, to, for you to test the output. And focus on data first. This is one of the biggest mistakes that I made uh, trying to basically get into this world. If you don't understand the data, if you don't manage the data, if you don't know where to get the data and to clean the data, you're going to fail miserably. Uh, it doesn't matter how amazing your system is, uh, knowing how to get the right data and to get it into the right form, it's the first step to success. So um, in terms of frameworks, as a programmer, obviously, again, uh, it's, it, it sounds like we need a recommendation engine to recommend machine le uh, learning uh, frameworks. This is only a small sample of what's out there. There's hundreds of machine learning uh, platforms, frameworks, uh, standalone algorithms that you can actually use. Uh, but like I said, first focus on learning and understanding the whole process. Uh, one of the one that's becoming the hot commodity, it's TensorFlow. And also, if you're learning and you're a Pythonista, I would say start with Scikit and move to TensorFlow. Uh, if you're in the Java world, um, down here I put basically the collection of things that uh, are Java related. Uh, there's some .NET stuff, and obviously Scala, uh, Ruby, and uh, um, I believe this is Python too, but there's, there's a, a few things out there that can help you basically get started. So my approach was to uh, pick something that was easy for me to grasp the whole process. And for that, I picked this product called Rapid Miner. Uh, Rapid Miner, it's, um, it's going to look a lot like an IDE that a lot of you ran away from in the past. Uh, those Java developers that became Ruby developers probably remember Eclipse. Uh, <laughs> so when I first opened Rapid Miner, I'm like, oh, no, I had like acid reflux, and I started sweating. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to go back. But it's a magnif magnificent product. It is amazing, and it actually has taught me more about machine learning than writing uh, a lot of code, which is, uh, you think it, it sounds uh, counterintuitive, but it's the way that it worked for me. So Rapid Miner, again, it's an Eclipse-based application that has an amazing uh, set of operators to basically do everything from classification. Uh, even right before this presentation, I found a recommendation extension where I could use to basically then test some of the systems that I was building uh, in parallel. So uh, give it a chance. Obviously, you need Java installed on your machine. So if, if you can live with the virus, then this is going, coming along for the ride. <laughs> Just kidding. The Java VM, it's an amazing platform, and I stand behind it 100%. The language, eh. OK, so let's talk about uh, one of the first types of uh, collaboration engines, which is the ones that rely on collaborative filtering, uh, So all sometimes known as the click-based recommendation engines. And again, the idea is collect large amounts of user feedback both uh, explicitly, uh, explicitly and implicitly, and infer uh, preferences for the specific users uh, that way, uh, so you can recommend items. So feedback, this is a topic that is actually dicey. Uh, you can get into a lot of uh, privacy issues, creepiness. Um, I, for example, when a system recommends an item to me, I want to know why. You know, some people are OK with the mystery. It's like, how did they know that I like, you know, uh, panda bear outfits and swords? <laughs> but <laughs> uh, that's a really strange combination there, but that happens in my brain. But I, I like to be uh, uh, presented an explanation of why the item was uh, recommended to me. Uh, so explicitly, you can like something, you can rate it, you can write a review. Uh, sentiment analysis is it's also another hot topic nowadays. So by reading, uh, and somebody was talking about uh, NLP, natural language processing. Now when you have sentiment analysis, uh, natural language uh, processing typically comes into play to figure out if it's a good review, it's a bad review, and how do you tell sarcasm? 
how do you tell uh, basically colloquialisms to the area where the user uh, that it's from wrote the, uh, the review? So those things are hard problems. Uh, sometimes I can't even tell other human beings are being sarcastic. You know, and we have this supercomputer in our, in, in our skull. Uh, imagine trying to do this with a collection of tags and things like that, or just words and tokens. So implicitly, uh, also explicitly, users tend to present feedback that represents the ideal way that they see themselves. While implicitly, users just do. And when you get implicit feedback, you're learning the true nature of that user. Uh, implicitly, it could be uh, at the highest level purchasing something. That means I really like it, I really need it. Uh, maybe I really need it, I don't like it, that's a whole different topic. Uh, searching for something, uh, you can, uh, based on a query, figure out uh, the likelihood that some items that match that query are to be liked by the user. Browsing, how long do you spend on a page? Did you scroll to the page? Did you read uh, the text on the page? Uh, obviously, uh, all of us have been trained by end user agreements to scroll really fast and click OK. So can you detect that? Do you know if the person actually read it? Uh, those are the things, the problems that at the UI front we're actually facing. And then there's, of course, uh, taking into account positive and negative feedback. So here's a, <laughs> an example of a reviews on Amazon that I forgot that I've done. Uh, in the U.S., we have Halloween, which is kind of a light version of uh, uh, Dia de los Muertos in Mexico. In, um, in, in Spain, I don't know what you have. I, I know that uh, you guys like to throw tomatoes at high speed at, at each other. That sounds a little more painful than Halloween. But um. So here's a couple of reviews. This one, for example, uh, the text, uh, it would be pretty hard to tell whether the review is uh, good or bad by a machine. So sentiment analysis will have to come into place. But Amazon's smart enough to basically bundle that with a start rating and also a, a direct sentiment expression. So in here, you can see that when I bought my uh, Halloween Fidel Castro outfit, <laughs> uh, it did not go well. The neighborhood in Arizona did not like that I was wearing this. But that's a whole different story over beers tonight. <laughs> So you can see that I have a title, I have a star rating, I have a sentiment. Uh, here's, for example, a good review. Uh, somebody that I knew wrote a book, and of course, as a good friend, I said, I love the book. I read the first chapter. Uh, so that's another problem. Uh, we lie. We lie a lot. We lie to ourselves. We lie to computers. We lie ar around the world. Uh, if you could really have a counter, like maybe a bell that goes ding every time you say a lie or a mild lie. Uh, a day, you'll be impressed. And as somebody that has a couple kids, they lie to me all the time. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of get on my high horse, and it's like, How can, it's like I, I just lied to you about something else like five minutes ago. So it's a, it's a human nature to aggrandize, to paint a picture of ourselves that it's the ideal picture, and, uh, and to basically uh, provide information that it's not very accurate for machines to deal with. So. To deal with this type of filtering, you start with a matrix. In this matrix, it's called a utility matrix. And it's a matrix of your users and your items. And on the intersection of those, you'll basically will have uh, either the star rating or the comments or whatever uh, the user has provided for that specific item. Uh, so you basically want to use the ratings of other users to find similar users. And the um, users or items. So there's two approaches. And they scale differently based on your environment. If you have a lot of users and a lot of items, or very few items and a lot of users, that, that determines which uh, approach you will use. But again, you want to figure out uh, items that are very similar to the items that you liked before and recommend those items. Or items that other users like you have liked before, and you want to also recommend those items. So the utility matrix, uh, you have uh, user item ratings. Uh, let's say that these are star uh, ratings. And the question marks are the users that did not provide a rating for a specific item. Now, this uh, matrix that I'm putting here as an example, it's very densely populated with ratings. 
what really happens is that you have a lot of question marks and very few numbers. So it is a, uh, a problematic uh, environment to basically find those uh, ratings. So of those two uh, styles, let's go with the first one, which is a user-based recommender. That means find users similar to you, find what they like and recommend those things or things that are like those things too. So again, it relies on finding similar users. The similarity it's, uh, between the users, it's the items in common. So for example, if you liked um, a specific book, let's say a, a Ruby on Rails book, you provided a three-star rating, I provided a four-star rating, that is a similarity between us. Now, the more things that we rated in common, the more similar we are. So if you can find, uh, basically do the pairwise comparison of uh, all your users, so again, if you have a lot of users, this becomes computationally expensive, you can now have a similarity measure between users, and now you can look at the items that, for example, you liked or purchased, but I never rated or seen before. And you can use those to uh, ask recommendations for me. So again, it relies on the items that we have in common to find similarities between the users. So uh, the first example, we're going to take that utility matrix, we're going to turn it on its head so we can uh, have a list of user IDs, products, and ratings. Um, so we depivot that table. And we have user ratings for the different users, uh, for the different items given by different users. And again, question marks for the missing items. And the goal is to predict those question marks. And some systems will basically do this in batch mode overnight. Let's find for, uh, probably you're gonna classify your users by the high-end purchasers, uh, the ones that browse but never buy, the ones in between that buy something from time to time, and then start with the high-value uh, customers and figure out uh, cu customer similarities between uh, those and other customers. So you can uh, start your recommendation list. So in this utility matrix, you can see that we actually use the rows to find similar users. So our row-wise uh, row comparison is what we use to find the similar users. Now, once we find the users, we need to, we need to basically uh, find the users. And to find the users, we need to have a measure of similarity. So how do we calculate similarity between two users? In, uh, in this case, uh, or items, it could be users or items. We need uh, a mathematical way to do that. One of the simplest algorithms, it's called the K nearest neighbors, or KNN. In KNN, uh, it's kind of a centroid type of approach where if we are looking to figure out uh, what users are similar to this user, we uh, use the K factor, that's where the, the KNN part of the KNN algorithm comes from, the nearest neighbor. So we're gonna use a factor of three uh, nearest neighbors. So in here, you can see that as I draw a circle around those uh, three nearest neighbors, um, I'm going to basically find these three users, and then I can take the average of what they like and use that to uh, compare them to me or to make recommendations. Now you can see that the classification or the similarity will change based on how many you pick. So this is one of those places where, as I was building systems with some of these technologies, I have to grab that circle and go wide, narrow. Sometimes there might be clusters, okay? And a small number will basically give you a pretty good answer. But as you open that circle, now you're grabbing two uh, clusters of different types of